I was born just a couple of blocks from here <laughs> at Doctors Hospital. So long ago, I hate to mention 1936, but that was the year. And I was delivered into the tender care of Dr. Benjamin Spock, who was a friend of my mother's, but before he got famous. And what I remember about Dr. Spock is just that he, his tongue depressors had little flecks of candy on them. When you try to remember your early childhood, there are, it's like looking at a photo album, certain things stand out, being taken to Central Park and seeing the sun blazing. Why remember that one scene? There was so much going on in New York, but that and the Macy's Day Parade are what I remember. And then came the war. I grew up uh, at first on 90th and then on 85th between Park and Lex, which sounds very chic, but it was a humble little building between two chic apartment buildings because my parents never had that much money. After the war, uh, my family moved to New Canaan, Connecticut because they thought New York would be too much and by that time they had three kids. So uh, Connecticut beckoned. I'm the eldest and then comes my brother Tony Lake and then I have a sister who's a brilliant classicist although uh, she doesn't practice, so to speak, as a professor. I was powerfully unpopular at the, uh, in the New Canaan public school system. My mother, who relished popularity, partly because she had had a little problem in Washington, uh, going to college, people looked down on her for going to college. That was then, this is now, what she was supposed to be doing was learning how to be a lady. And that didn't really go with studying. At least this is what my mother told me. She was class of 1926 at Smith. And uh, maybe things weren't as bad as she told me, but it gave her a, a profound anxiety about other people liking you. And if you're too intellectual, they might not like you. Uh, they liked her when she died. Lots of people told me how wonderful she had been. I was in the fourth grade when we moved to New Canaan, Connecticut after the war. And my BFF, best friend forever, uh, was Jewish. In New Canaan, Connecticut, when her parents bought their house, there had been a petition to the owner not to sell to these people. It, yeah, it, it, it was awful. In the fourth grade, I'd been in New Canaan for just a few months. Some guy came in, another fourth grader, tried to sit next to me, not because of me, but the chair was in a good position. And um, up came my best friend and said, I, I think that's my chair. And he looked at her and said, get out of here, you big fat Jew. Well, Mary was very thin, small. So she said to him, no, I'm a small, thin Jew. Whereupon he said, what's a Jew? He just knew this was an insult. He didn't know anything about it. <laughs> I once asked her mother, what is a Jew, and got a little history. Because she still had family in Eastern Europe during the Holocaust. Yeah. Father was a faculty brat, because my grandfather taught at Harvard. Um, they were appalled by the anti-Semitism that they ran up against, not against them, but against others. And because of their background in sophisticated New York, they were a few decades, I think, ahead of the rest of the country. We've caught up until some people very recently. <laughs> 
Most people that my parents knew knew that Hitler was persecuting the Jews. I still wasn't quite clear what a Jew was, but uh, that's why I had to ask my friend Mary's mother. But it was still in the papers on occasion. We just didn't know how bad it was. We knew it was bad, but we didn't know how bad. Six million? No, when I went away to boarding school, I finally got a boyfriend who later, after two years, admitted that he had been using me to try to get rid of his gay instincts, but it hadn't worked. When he kissed me, he still didn't feel anything. He's now a retired professor. And of course, in those days, not only was being gay terrible, but you um, tried to find methods to get rid of it, which we now know don't work. And many years later, a friend of mine saw him in a gay bar outside Washington, and I thought, yes, at last, he can be free. I didn't marry till 21, which seems awfully young these days. But um, the minister in the Congregationalist Church where we went, um, my mother's compromise, she was Anglican. My father had dropped out of the Anglican Church because it was mean to my grandfather. Uh, so they compromised on the Congregational Church. And the minister there, Lauren Chase, he was so attractive, so smart, so wise. He made me feel belonging. Whereas a lot of people, and I exaggerated this in my mind, would scoff at religious belief. Mr. Chase made it seem rational, wonderful, interesting, and um, I've always been grateful to him. I didn't want to educate children. I wanted to educate college kids. And I was only two or three years older than the senior ones. And it sounds crazy, but you know, I've just never graduated from Barnard. I went there uh, after transferring from Harvard. And uh, I loved it. I went on and got a doctorate, despite having two babies. And I just never wanted to leave. So I stayed put. And in those days, you didn't have to advertise an interview. It, it was uh, not fair. Colleges simply took people they knew who knew people who knew people. It's all very different now. Well, I, sh I, I should begin with a tiny story. I hope you'll forgive me. Uh, when I went on my honeymoon with Peter, we were going to spend a year in Paris, but we stopped off in England for a real honeymoon. And we stayed with a friend of my book reviewer father-in-law, a significant English historian called A.L. Rouse. And I said, Professor Rouse, I'm going to be in Paris for almost a year. I haven't even finished college. What should I do? I'll be going to the Sorbonne. What should I do? And he said, remember, most successful academics have an area they study so they become known as, you know, the George Gascoigne expert and so on. He said, make yourself an expert on Anglo-French relations during the Renaissance. There had been a book about it, but from long ago, and not terribly good. The courses I took at the Sorbonne, not for credit, um, were the first half of French Renaissance literature. And they talked about Rabelais a lot. So I got intrigued, read him in French yet, and um, since, of course, mostly in English, and uh, fell in love because he's a jet stream of words, words, vocabulary, 
85 adjectives for the uh, smoke that can come out of a smoker or what have you. I, I can uh, read it, Renaissance French pretty well, so I did a book on how the English responded to Rabelais, and that was fun. And so I tracked his reputation a little bit, and his reputation is for being dirty, which he was, but mostly about bathrooms. Not that they had bathrooms yet. Not so much about sex. He has this reputation for being dirty-minded, but it's not much about boy-girl. And um, he got bounced off Columbia's required reading list for its course on, for freshmen. And I was told, I wasn't there at the meeting, but I was told later that one of the things that appalled people was his imagining a wall around Paris. And the wall would be made of vulvas. And uh, I told the person who told me this, wait, 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 wait a minute. It's not just vulvas. It's also monks' penises. So he's got both genitalia. And what's the point? The point is that the best protection of a city isn't guns and concrete. It's making babies. You need people. So it, it's a little dirty allegory. Make babies, not war. Uh, or as we said in the 60s, make love, not war. But we forget that we haven't gotten dirtier minded than the Renaissance. We've come back to where we used to be after the Victorians. I had a student once who stopped me on the way to the elevator. I had been teaching Chaucer, The Miller's Tale. She said, you know, I didn't know they they could write like that then, think like that. I said, look, if they couldn't think and talk about sex, we wouldn't be here. And <laughs> she looked astounded. That, that was fun. But mostly what I love about Rabelais is his use of language. He doesn't just say, she was wearing a beautiful dress. He'll give you 50 adjectives running down the page to describe the dress and how beautiful it was. He's a fount of words, 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 and I love that. Uh, Rabelais begins his writing a few years after Martin Luther, not many, but a few. And uh, he allegorizes the Reformation as a huge storm at sea with boats sinking around you and so on. But he still is writing before the Catholic Church became quite so virtuous. Some people would say it's gone back. Uh, he was not particularly anti-Catholic, but the issues were important to him. Do we have free will? And his famous instruction that the oracle gives us is Fesica Vudra, do as thou wilt, which means you have will, otherwise you can't do what you will. And this was one of the big arguments with the um, Protestant, especially the more extreme versions, uh, but still most Protestants denied free will. God has everything figured out ahead of time. I uh, had a husband who worked in New York at Newsweek, although he worked mostly at home, and we had easy access to the big city even before we moved here. And so I felt blessed to be teaching at Barnard in Columbia, 
because I didn't have to move. I had to commute from New Canaan, Connecticut. But there was no longing for Boston or if somebody had said, I was considered at, by Harvard at one point, I don't think seriously considered, but my name was on the list of people they were thinking about to hire to teach the Renaissance. And uh, had I been told, you're our first choice, I would have had to say no. I can't move further from New York. So I was just so damn lucky to be teaching in New York City. Well, you want to talk about Peter and how long ago you lost him? Uh, this is a ridiculous thing to say, but it meant so much to me that I have repressed the memory of which year it was. Uh, he died on Shakespeare's birthday, April 23rd. And after being in the hospital for a full month, holding my hand at one point and saying, you have to be brave. And like so many people getting irrational at the end and even singing, it's um, moving but scary to see people who you know are going to die any minute. Losing him was not only painful, but a uh, little scary. I'd never seen anybody that close to death who wasn't going to die, you know, within a few minutes. This was um, strange and weird. They loved him in the hospital. I didn't see him at the very end. I got a phone call from the hospital saying he will be uh, dead by morning. I said, I will be right there. And they said, don't bother. But I wish I had insisted so I could have been there at the end. We got married in 1957. And when I was 21 and he was 22, and I have this is so ridiculous, but I have repressed the memory of which year he actually died. But we were married for about 40 years. But it, it is fascinating to me, I cannot remember the year. The day, yes, but not the year. Our parents were both at a very small New Year's Eve party given by a mutual friend, and the number of guests was something like 10. And I was there, and Peter was there. And I had never tasted anything alcoholic, but I was given a little champagne. I had to go upstairs and vomit. <laughs> I had never drunk champagne before. But Peter uh, was there, and dancing, the Charleston, which the parents wanted to do because they had been there in the 20s. So Peter danced to Charleston a little bit, and I was deeply impressed by his wit, good humor, charm. He was 14. No, he was 15. I was 14. And I would see him at dances in New Canaan. And um, then after my adventure with my turned out to be gay, boyfriend, I was going off to Harvard, and Peter thought, aha, I know a girl among the freshmen. So he invited me out, and we just hit it off. And so I was engaged at 18, married at 21, widowed in my 60s, <laughs> and at a it's been a good life. It's, uh, my husband died too soon, but otherwise, I had a good marriage while he was here. Yeah. Well, being a, 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 eventually a book reviewer, first for a now defunct journal called Look, and then for Newsweek, we met an awful lot of interesting people. It was a great deal of fun, though I've noticed when you are widowed, I think it's from a very early Indo-European word meaning empty.
uh, you can be treated as though invisible. I was fascinated by how many of the friends he knew at his club, which is essentially a literary cultural one called The Century, how many of his friends there, not all, would look through me. It, it, it's a common experience. I don't feel picked on or singled out, and I was made a member of the club, so I do go there and see people at least once a month. Um, Bob Caro, the one who wrote a biography of Lyndon Johnson, Bob Caro and his wife, they were perhaps our closest friends. And um, other people at the century, especially, and people he met through being a book reviewer. But uh, Bob Caro was our closest. And we're still on hugging terms. Oh. And he, Peter didn't like church ceremonies or anything that put him into a crowd. So he um, went to a funeral. I forget whose funeral. And he began to get restive the way he did during a church ceremony. And he made his way out of the church into a park and sat down. And lo, next to him, was Kurt Vonnegut, to whom he had given bad reviews. It was an embarrassing moment, but they both behaved like gentlemen and had a pleasant conversation. <laughs> so he thought of Vonnegut as a bit of a show-off, rather than as a genuinely great satirical writer. And Peter had read enough satire from the 18th century to modern times to be able to say with some authority, but not kindness, that Vonnegut just wasn't up to Pope and Stern, who wrote a novel or two. I'm not saying he was right about Vonnegut, just that that was the issue. There are greater satirists. Vonnegut thinks he's one of them. He isn't. Uh, I have no opinion on this. Uh, I read everything Peter wrote and sometimes had suggestions. And when I went to Paris on my own and was away for two weeks, he did something wrong in one of his reviews. I can't remember. Split infinitive, <laughs> something fairly innocent like that. And Peter would dutifully read most of what I wrote. But it was not his world. So we tended each to go our own way, lovingly, but separately. He wrote what I think is an utterly brilliant little book about his first year at Harvard. I gave him the title, and his publisher said it would have sold better without the title I used, which is from a poem by William Blake. Blake describes children playing on a green in the village and at the end, the sun is going down, the kids are growing up, and sport no more seen on the darkening green. So darkening green was Peter's title. It was about his freshman year at Harvard. And because he kept a journal that I must do more about, I'm giving it to Columbia. They have some, but not all. Um, because Peter had kept a journal, large segments of the book are from the journal he kept in 1954 at Harvard before the big move into the 60s. And then he wrote, I think, a fascinating book, although it's no longer uh, completely relevant, on juvenile justice in the New York courts and how we handle uh, criminal youth. It's just that they've now reformed some of the courts and it isn't quite relevant anymore. And he wrote a book about the Trote School. He had been fascinated in 1968 how these uh, prep school kids, and he had gone to Trote himself, how these prep school kids were reacting 
to the 60s. And I would come home from Columbia describing the moment when the police were called on campus, for example, and I had been standing in one of the lines around the uh, low library when the cops came and the big bust happened. We were told all women should leave. And Peter found that fascinating because Choate was going through exactly the same thing. My grandfather was a very distinguished biblical scholar. He gets four pages in Wikipedia. <laughs> K-I-R-S-O-P-P, -P, Lake, L-A-K-E. I'm Anne Cordop Kersop Lake Prescott. And uh, he had a fascinating career. He taught in Leiden. Uh, he was from Oxford, taught in Leiden, and was invited by Harvard. He got a divorce eventually. And uh, her case was he had had mistresses, which was true. Harvard Divinity School fired him whereupon the English department rehired him on the grounds that we English professors don't care about people's moral turpitude. <laughs> Shakespeare was just as immoral. My other grandparents were journalists who met in Chicago working for different papers and using that underground air chute that they have to send little love notes to each other. Then they moved to Washington and were Washington journalists. Republican, but those days Republican, not modern, re recent Republicans. And uh, because they were political journalists, they were pals with some of the uh, presidents. My grandfather knew and loved Teddy Roosevelt. Roosevelt got wounded at one point uh, in surgery. He had some surgery done, I think, here on his rear end. Some political figure was visiting him in the hospital when my grandfather arrived and the figure, whoever it was, was leaving. And Teddy Roosevelt said, Bill, it's so good to see you. I, I just couldn't stand talking to him. I was about to show him my scar pointing to his rear end to make him go away. <laughs> uh, so they were good good journalists, but so devoted to the Republican Party that they found uh, the coming of more Democrats, the New Deal, very painful. My grandmother did refer to him as that man in the White House. My mother, their daughter, toddled down to the um, New Canaan's town hall on the arm of the Visiting Nurse Association woman and changed her registration when she was about 90 to Democrat. She hoped her parents were not lamenting in heaven somewhere, but my brother was working for Bill Clinton, so she figured she really had to do that. <laughs> Great moment in our family. <laughs> my brother loved working at UNICEF. It was great for him. So he was head of UNICEF, but he didn't sit there running a desk in New York. He traveled all over the place meeting hungry kids. If um, we shared a taxi, I would offer to pay. He would say, send it to UNICEF, which I would do. Some of the students I've taught, like the novelist Mary Gordon, for example, or the woman who is now in Tezaka Shange, that those Barnard women and some Columbia students who've gone out into the great world, I hope have learned to enjoy reading a little more, have had their minds, their wonderful minds, even more broadened. And the articles I've written, the books I've written, I think have opened yet more pathways, because I have no illusion I'm alone, um, into understanding cultures that are so radically different from our own. And I think that's not just useful, but vital. I had a student from China who told me she found it hard to relate 
to some of the beliefs that these people had. I said, I, I don't believe in those beliefs either, that we should all worship the king. No, I'm a good Democrat. But it's vital to learn how to imagine things you don't believe. That's why anthropology is useful and important. So I agree with you. I can't relate to these ideas either. Good, except to say, no, I don't think like that. But to learn how to think differently is, I think, the main lesson I've tried to teach these wonderful young people. The education field. Well, just to continue on with the church for a moment, when I moved back to New Canaan as an adult, the Presbyterian minister I, I had was in his understanding, his humor, his um, ability to climb mountains in Vermont, which I found difficult. Uh, he was a major influence. One reason I give money to Union Theological is that he went there. Some professors, even after I graduated, were consoling when I ran up against problems, friendly, full of anecdotes, loving. I don't really know what's left to do in my immediate field except to continue what we are doing, which is encouraging openness to what in the field we tend to call the other. It's important when you read older literature, and I do teach a few classical texts, it's important, I think, to be open to that other, not that it will make you change your mind about us, but it will give you practice in understanding different cultures. And even Rabelais' dirtiness, what purpose does it serve? If you have people who are beginning to deny the human body, maybe it's important to have some bathroom humor. If you have people who worship the king, maybe it's important to have somebody who's skeptical about that or who can tell you why falling down and worshiping Queen Elizabeth might have been a useful move. And what do you know? A woman can be a great queen. That's important to remember, too.